This is CBC Nova Scotia News. Good evening. The Progressive Conservative government in Nova Scotia tabled its third budget today. It is a document that continues massive spending on health care, but also gives a nod to cost of living pressures. It comes as the province gets closer to an election year. Michael Gorman breaks down the numbers. The budget unveiled today includes revenues of $15.8 billion against expenses of $16.5 billion. The deficit is projected to be $460 million. Finance Minister Alan McMaster says his government remains focused on fixing the province's health care system and there's more than $7 billion toward that effort. Among other things, there's $184 million to help address wait times and access to diagnostic testing and surgery. There's $75 million to help advance electronic patient records and more money for cancer care and hospital construction. Funding for doctors clocks in at $1.2 billion. The budget also includes $36 million toward the creation of universal mental health and addictions care. But McMaster says it's also time to broaden his government's focus. Cost of living has become top of mind for people as we experience some of the highest increases in inflation in 30 years. The number one ask by Nova Scotians in this year's budget consultation was for tax relief and they're going to get it. Tax relief will come through income tax brackets, the basic personal amount, and some non-refundable tax credits being indexed to the rate of inflation starting in January. That amounts to an average savings of between $69 and $259 per person next year, depending on their tax bracket. The average savings increase is to between $231 and $863 in 2028. Premier Tim Houston says it's a big deal. And it is a, a very, very significant, meaningful form of tax relief. And I believe that we'll, we'll, we'll end up to be the biggest uh, tax break for Nova Scotia, certainly in their history. The government also announced $18.8 .8 million to begin the rollout of a school lunch program. Officials say it will start with elementary schools in the fall and take four years to reach every school in the province. The timeline could be shortened if a deal is reached with the federal government for funding. Opposition leaders welcomed news of the lunch program and the indexing of tax brackets, but they say income assistance rates also should have been indexed and increased for everyone. Monthly payments are going up for 60% of recipients. Zach Churchill and Claudia Chender say the budget does not go far enough to help people struggling with the cost of living. The province can actually afford to cut the HST right now. They brought in an additional billion dollars in taxes last year that they didn't even know about. Uh, and if we're going to help working class, middle class people and low income Nova Scotians, we have to ensure that they're not paying the high sales tax in the country. You know, we have a massive, massive number of uh, Nova Scotians in core housing need and lots of middle class folks who just, you know, struggle each month uh, to pay the rent. And we see almost nothing uh, to help those folks in this budget. And that's really concerning. During their first two years in office, the Tories benefited from tax revenues that came in well above budget projections. That resulted in more than a billion dollars in unbudgeted spending in 2023-24. It remains to be seen if that will happen again this year. Finance officials say growth from an increasing population will continue this year, although the trend is expected to slow. Michael Gorman, CBC News, Halifax. I'll talk to the finance minister about what's in the budget and what's not. That's our Newsmaker interview just after 6.30. Halifax is preparing to take new steps to get people out of tent encampments. More than 50 people received eviction notices earlier this month at five sites. But when the deadline came earlier this week, the city did not enforce it. Now officials say they're going to remove people's possessions and cut off their access to power. Taryn Grant reports. Ten tents are still standing at Grand Parade, including one that's home to this man and his pregnant wife. They've been homeless since their apartment in Hammonds Plains burned down in a wildfire last year. They spent some time at a shelter, but they didn't feel safe. We've been trying our hardest. We've been doing everything we can do, but there's just no help, nobody to help step forward. The gentleman here that takes care of the park with us, he tries to help us and feed us as much as possible and, you know, do what he can do. and. But there's just no help from the government or no help from the city just to lend us a hand, you know. The gentleman he's referring to is Steve Wilsack, who's been volunteering here for the past three months. I am pleading, don't 
move people unless there's a place for them to go. The city and the province say people do have options for moving inside, but Wilsack disputes that. There has been misinformation in terms of that there are places for people to go. Other than an emergency shelter, which is not home, people need four walls, housing first. Tents at Grand Parade have been connected to a power generator since January, which they rely on for heat. But tomorrow, the city says it's turning it off. I hope they don't, but if they do, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what my wife's going to do, two of us. We're just trying to live day by day right now, find housing, and housing here in Halifax is just real, real hard right now. Other residents are also at a loss. This man has been at Grand Parade for six months. In his tent are all of his possessions, which the city says it's going to throw away. I'm not happy about it. It's cold, it's winter. We have nowhere to go. So what would they like us to do? So the city gave notice yesterday about their plans, but so far there's no sign of them actually enacting those plans, at least not here at Grand Parade. Up at Victoria Park, which is another one of the tent encampments that's set to be cleared out, they did drop off a dumpster today, but there are still many tents there, and it doesn't look like anyone has left since they got notice yesterday about these new plans. Back here at Grand Parade, though, it's business as usual, and it's been quite quiet. Today, it's just been the residents here. There have been some outreach workers who have stopped by to check in on them and there's the usual pedestrian traffic and that leaves the residents to just sit and wait nervously to see what happens next. Tom and Amy. All right thank you for that Taryn. That's Taryn Grant reporting live for us this evening from Grand Parade. Meanwhile tenants in the Halifax area are speaking up after being forced out of affordable units by fixed term leases. Those units are then renovated and the rent increased. That practice has advocates concerned that when affordable units are lost, they'll never come back. Nicola Sagan reports. Keely Corrigan was the last piece of the puzzle. The only tenant left in her nine-unit building in North End Dartmouth. Emptied and slated for renovations, made possible by fixed-term leases. They're using it to get people out, raise the rent, get somebody new in. The rent was affordable for the low-income tenants, but their leases all had a set end date that the landlords enforced. Corrigan worries rents in this range will never return as units are put back on the market for more money. I understand it's a business. I understand they want to make money off of this. However, at some point, you know, you have to have a heart. Like, people need a place to live. They can't be out on the streets. Corrigan's landlords didn't respond to CBC's request for comment. But her concerns are backed up by data. Last year, Halifax's average rent had its largest jump since this data began being recorded in the 80s. And Nova Scotia's rate of rental inflation was the highest in the country. The 5% rent cap is in place for almost two more years. But fixed-term leases let landlords bring in new tenants who aren't covered by the cap. Investors increasingly are seeing those lower end housing uh, uh, apartment options as an opportunity to, to increase rents and make money quickly. And Hayes says between the 2016 and the 2021 census, Halifax lost more than 8,000 affordable housing units, often by being renovated and flipped. They're not coming back. No one is building $700 a month uh, rental units. Uh, Ben Wilson also lost housing he could afford after his landlord did renovations and his fixed-term lease expired. He was offered a new one but couldn't pay the higher price. It was unlivable conditions from being realistic, but I put up with it assuming that I'd get another lease once the construction was finished. Wilson's landlord told CBC News that property owners are dealing with skyrocketing expenses, far outpacing the rent cap. The province says it's working to find ways to balance landlords' rising costs and tenants' need for rent stability to make fixed-term leases a less popular option. Nicola Sagan, CBC News, Halifax. And new data shows that the Cape Breton Regional Municipality has the worst vacancy rate in Nova Scotia. The numbers from the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation show that the vacancy rate in CBRM is 0.8 percent. That is lower than Halifax and among the lowest in the entire country. Experts say it's the result of a large number of international students attending Cape Breton University and Cape Bretoners returning home after years of working out west. 
Recently, the federal government announced $13.3 million in funding to fast-track construction of 367 housing units in Cape Breton over the next three years. And Ryan Snodden joins us now on a day that started out pretty darn nicely, didn't it? Yes, and then it dipped down awfully <laughs> fast. Yeah, it was wet, but it was warm this morning. That is for sure. Just a wild swing temperature-wise today, uh, right as advertised. Uh, look at our temperatures at 5 a.m. this morning. Widespread double digits. Uh, that front had just moved through Yarmouth at 5 a.m. And then crash those temperatures did from west to east throughout the day there's 9 a.m already below freezing in yarmouth still seven uh, in halifax double digits in cape breton and then by noon we we're at zero in halifax sydney was still at eight degrees and we've continued to tick down three o'clock sydney was the last spot to drop below the freezing mark already minus four there it's minus seven in Amherst and Parsboro right now, minus seven in Kentville and minus six in Halifax. That's just the temperature. This is what it feels like, minus double digits. So in terms of what it actually feels like, feels about 20 degrees difference uh, from this morning. So an incredible, powerful cold front indeed. Uh, we've got some flurries in the mix right now on the other side of this front as it moves across Newfoundland and those flurries will linger through tonight. Could see a couple of centimeters of light accumulation for the mainland. Inverness County could pick up as much as 15 centimeters with some snow squalls setting up there uh, north of Mabu. There's the area of high pressure which is settling in and it is going to help direct some milder air back into the mix. Temperature swings, you want them? You got them. How about this? So this is this evening. Watch temperature, just temperature wise. We're starting the morning in the minus 7 to minus 14 range, feeling widespread minus teens and 20s tomorrow morning. And then uh, temperatures are going to stay pretty chilly throughout the day tomorrow, in fact, well below the freezing mark. But as we move into Saturday, the winds shift back to southerly. We're mid to high single digits Saturday mid to high single digits again on Sunday. Now we will be sprinkling in some showers here for Sunday. No question about it as this area of high pressure moves out. Tom and Amy, uh, we're going to increase the clouds through Saturday and then we've got this low that's going to kind of sit and spin for a few days off to our south and that will be certainly throwing some moisture into the mix. So the warm up will come with a price tag eventually of some showers, but we'll walk you through that with your full seven day forecast coming up in a few minutes. Okay. Lots to talk about there. Okay, thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Representatives of the Maritime Elver Fishery are calling on the federal government to implement enforceable regulations for moderate livelihood fishing by Indigenous people. They told a Senate committee in Ottawa that ambiguity is leading to unauthorized harvesting of the baby eels on dozens of rivers in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Paul Withers reports. We are pioneers of this industry. The appearance comes as the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans considers cancelling the upcoming season an acknowledgement that once again DFO is unable to manage this fishery. I implore you not to believe any of the misleading statements that removing legal fishers from rivers will reduce the number of illegal and unregulated fishers taking our place. Poachers will be out in force as soon as the elvers start running, as they were during the shutdowns of 2020 and 2023. She's referring to the hundreds of unauthorized harvesters eager to cash in on the tiny translucent eels that are shipped live to Asia and grown for food. As Mi'kmaq people, all of this is our territory. It's on ceded Mi'kmaq land, Webinaki. and we are allowed to fish anywhere we want. Many are Indigenous, asserting their treaty right to earn a moderate living from fishing, claiming they do not need DFO approval, despite a Supreme Court ruling to the contrary. Commercial license holders say the department must put its requirements in writing. If DFO tries to enforce the law, the courts and the prosecutors say, well, there's no regulation that says they can't. So DFO simply needs to make a regulation saying, here's what the can, the do's and don'ts are, and they need to apply it to all First Nations. Uh, 3,600 kilogram tack. The Elver fishing plan put forward by the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq chiefs would take more than a third of the maritime-wide total allowable catch to be fished by about 600 people. It's not clear if they will defy a closure. We feel that she doesn't have the ability to make a unilateral decision to do that without our 
um, input, you know. Nor is the enforcement response any clearer. DFO declined comment today. It says it's still considering feedback received since it announced its intention to cancel the season earlier this month. Paul Withers, CBC News, Halifax. A new public prosecution's policy hopes to change the way black people in the province move through the criminal justice system. It is called the fair treatment of African Nova Scotians and people of African descent involved in criminal prosecution's policy. It was announced last night at the Black Cultural Centre in Cherrybrook. The policy, designed to help law professionals view various aspects of criminal cases through a more culturally competent lens. That includes arraignment, bail and sentencing, even the initial decision who to, pros to prosecute. Robert Wright with the African Nova Scotian Justice Institute says getting the policy implemented hasn't been easy. I'm optimistic that we got to the place where there is now a policy in place. Um, it would be fair to say that over the last year or so, it's been a rocky road toward to this moment in time. Um, it, I think it would be fair to say that there was significant opposition, internal opposition to the policy, uh, perhaps even internal um, lack of understanding of its necessity. Rick Woodburn, the acting director of the Public Prosecution Service, says the policy is not only about changing the system, but also about fostering trust in the black community. The father of a 34-year-old Cape Breton University student who died in a 2022 house fire is suing his son's landlords and two of his roommates. The statement of claim, which has not been proven in court, alleges there was inadequate fire safety equipment and fellow tenants failed to extinguish smoking materials properly. Rajesh Galapudi died of injuries he sustained in that fire that consumed his residence in Sydney. Court documents show the landlords have already been charged with several fire safety infractions and are expected to enter a plea next month in provincial court. Well, if you're one of the millions of Canadians who work today, you may not have gotten paid. Those on a fixed annual salary are likely not getting paid for the extra day during the leap year. The average salaried worker may be losing out on hundreds of dollars while employers collectively saved billions. The CBC's Philippe de Montenay reports. In the heart of Toronto's financial district, many who earn a yearly salary are not too happy to find out they aren't getting paid for the extra day of work during leap years. I think it's pretty brutal. I know for myself, if I'm working, I want to be paid. Like, you still have your expenses for that day. I think we should be compensated. Some argue it's a give and take. Being salaried comes with other benefits and more flexibility. I'm not necessarily a nine to five kind of gal, even if that's what my contract says. The reality is I'm expected to yield a certain amount of work and that's, that's what I'm getting paid to do. It's a quarter of a day every four years, so that doesn't really kind of move that bottom line for me a whole lot. But for some, it can add up to hundreds of dollars. Crunching the latest figures from Statistics Canada, the average salaried worker is losing out on $351 for a typical eight-hour day. And with more than 6.5 million people earning a fixed annual salary, about a third of Canada's workforce, employers collectively save more than $2 billion. We use the term wage theft because it is a form of theft that workers are experiencing. And it's a much broader issue the Workers' Action Centre is looking to tackle. From unpaid public holidays and overtime to withheld employee benefits. This is a real crisis in Canada and, and people are feeling it more because every dollar counts when the cost of living is as high as it is now. People who receive annual salary will usually spend more hours of work in a year than what they're actually paid for. It's kind of expected from them. It's included in their salary. Some contracts include pay for leap days, but it's still pretty uncommon. It's ultimately up to employers and currently no law forces them to do so. Philip de Montigny, CBC News, Toronto. Just a pleasure to work with you today. <laughs> Even if it's for free, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> First quick break on the way. Stay with us. There's a lot more to come on CBC Nova Scotia News. <laughs> the federal health minister releases the long-awaited details on Ottawa's pharmacare plan. 
Canada is bringing back visa requirements for Mexican travelers after a surge of bogus asylum claims. All right, there's a look at downtown Halifax on the waterfront there. Ryan is up next with his full weather forecast. We'll see you in just a minute. All right, we're entering the deep freeze in Nova Scotia for sure. <laughs> Lots of drama in the weather this month, huh? Yeah, for sure. It's been up, it's been down. It's, I mean, we've had, yeah, the epic snowstorms, mm -hmm. uh, the rain, and um, yeah, I mean, it has been dramatic to say the least. It's almost over. It's March almost over, yeah. Yeah, definitely. You got Good the extra day today. To yeah, February. Exactly. That's <laughs> right. One more day for February to stick it to us. Uh, I don't get to use this graphic very often, so it's one of my favorites uh, as we look at the temperature change from this time yesterday to now. And you can see how much the Maritimes has dropped. Places like uh, Charlotte there have dropped 24 degrees wow. in 24 mm. hours. And you can see New Brunswick, certainly the, the most dramatic change, but Nova Scotia, anywhere from 17 at Greenwood, uh, 15 at the airport in Halifax. So uh, definitely a huge drop. And there's where we are across Nova Scotia right now. 
Uh, temperatures will continue to drop down. As you can see, Sable Island still at the freezing mark, but everywhere else uh, certainly below freezing now. And those winds are going to continue to be a factor for tonight. Easing, uh, but still sustained right now. 40 to even 50, 67 at Westport, as you can see. Uh, 33 at Amherst, 44 at Caribou Point. That station gusting to 60, gusting to 70 at Lunenburg. 85 at Westport, uh, so it's definitely still quite breezy out there. And uh, by the way, we did see some pretty strong wind gusts. I meant to throw that graphic in, uh, but uh, yeah, that one uh, skipped by. So we'll uh, make sure we circle back to that at the end of the show. Widespread gusts though, uh, 70 to 90 kilometers per hour. And we did crack 100 in more than a few spots, including Digby. Halifax Airport was at 102 um, and uh, East Knoll at uh, Cobbequid Bay, 119, a localized gust there. So uh, that was, of course, last night, and it was howling, wasn't it? Uh, we'll see those, uh, we can see those wind chills already in the minus double digits and teens out there right now. So it's pretty chilly if you're heading out for that dog walk uh, this evening. Bundle up and be mindful that things or have of course turned icy after all of that water, all of that rain, that runoff, uh, things are turning icy out there. So. Keep an extra watch on that first step on your walkway or any untreated surfaces through this evening. Area of high pressure, that's going to clear us out for tonight and we'll keep some sunshine in the mix even into Saturday. This is the low that's just starting to develop here along the Gulf of Mexico. That's going to hit the coast and then work its way northward and that will throw clouds and showers into the mix for a good chunk of next week as we certainly start uh, March, well not start March, tomorrow is of course starting March on a, on a cold note, but uh, for the rest of the week, March looking uh, certainly quite mild. Minus 13 in Edmonton, minus 5 in Calgary, so you can see that cold air kind of in the north of Canada, but that milder air starting to creep its way back in. Chance for some flurries at, for, for tonight, no question about it. Uh, the best chances are going to be in the north and east. For the Northumberland Shore region, could see a couple centimeters here, could see five to even 10 centimeters for uh, Inverness County north of Mabu. And we are looking at those temperatures starting in the minus double digit range for a good portion of us. As we move throughout tomorrow, you can see a solid mix of sun and cloud across the province. Note that those onshore flurries and the squall chances continue in through northern Inverness County. Another five centimeters, no question uh, possible there. Uh, so totals over the next uh, 24 hours could add up to around uh, 15 centimeters in some cases there uh, for the highlands. Temperatures tomorrow for those highs near the freezing mark. Digby, Yarmouth and Shelburne counties minus two to minus four for a good portion of the valley into the South Shore region, including the Halifax area. Minus six to seven for the east, uh, especially Cape Breton, minus seven, maybe even minus eight up through uh, northern Inverness County. Wind chill values tomorrow morning will be in the minus teens and 20s by lunchtime, uh, backing off a little bit, but still very brisk from start to finish. So make sure the kids are dressed warm uh, when they head to school for tomorrow. Look, it's Saturday, five, six, seven, eight degrees across the board. Increasing clouds, chance of some late day showers pushing into the Tri-County area. As we mentioned earlier, this next system will be throwing some more moisture into the mix, certainly in the form of cloud cover and shower chances, not only Sunday, uh, but likely into Monday and Tuesday. And yeah, it's looking a little unsettled next week for sure. Certainly plenty of clouds. Uh, not all of these days will be constant showers, but shower chances, no question, as we work our way through next week. But temperatures certainly mild. Tom and Amy. I have no snow left in my yard. No, like, I know the snow's crazy gone. Crazy how fast it's the gone. snow melted, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks so much, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Up next, I'll talk with Nova Scotia Finance Minister Alan McMaster about his party's latest budget released today. That's our Newsmaker interview. Stay with us. You're watching CBC Nova Scotia News.
The Houston government has released its latest provincial budget, which continues with massive spending on health care and some help for some people feeling cost of living pressures. Alan McMaster, Nova Scotia's Minister of Finance, is with us now. Welcome. Well, thank you. Nice to be here. I heard you say that Nova Scotians wanted uh, tax relief, and they're going to be getting that in the, in the indexed uh, tax brackets and in basic personal amount. It's uh, between 65 and or 69, $269 dollars a person. Doesn't sound like a lot of money. How much relief really is that? It'll start coming for people in January of 2025. They'll notice it on their paycheck. Uh, there'll be less money coming off, more going into their pocket. And this is the kind of tax relief that's going to get bigger and bigger every year. So it's going to compound every year as it's indexed, it'll become worth more and more to people. So it is a big decision point. It's something people ask for. It was the number one ask in budget consultations, and we were able to provide it. Why not uh, take a couple points off the HST? Uh, you know, if, if people want tax relief and they want a lot of mo more money in their pocket, wouldn't that be a better way to do it? Well, income tax is, is something that, you know, anybody that has to pay income tax, they're all paying it. Um, consumption taxes like HST, uh, certainly people need to buy a certain amount of things, but once you get past that, uh, people who have more money can buy probably limit, it's unlimited how much they could buy and could benefit from an HST cut. We felt the income tax relief was something that was better for everybody and it was also the number one thing that people asked for was to actually income tax, index the income tax brackets, but we went a little step further. We, we indexed the uh, basic personal amount and we also indexed various tax credits. All told, it'll mean more tax relief. Talking about people who are affording things, there's a lot of people in this province who can afford a lot less. Um, and yet, your government has not increased the income allowance for the third budget now. Uh, why not? Don't, surely there must be more that needs to be done there. Well, we actually did increase it by $300 more per month for 60% of people who are on income assistance. This was, this was just recently. Yes, it's actually part of this budget. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a significant increase, and I understand that will be anywhere from a 22 to 44 percent increase for people uh, who have disabilities. And that uh, That's forms... just people with disabilities, though. Yes. So I'm talking about everyone who's on income allowance. Mm -hmm. Your budget hasn't increased that for everyone. Well, there are supports throughout the budget, and every ministry has a role to play. Uh, one of the other significant things we announced today uh, was a school lunch program. So anybody that is having difficulty making ends meet at home and sending their children to school, a school lunch program combined with a breakfast program will ensure that some of that pressure to provide food for their children going to school, uh, some of that pressure comes off them at home. That would help. I could see that helping a family, but that's not going to be fully rolled out for four years. Why is it taking so long to get what should be a fairly simple mm -hmm. program out and running? Uh, every school is different in the province. And uh, we have, for instance, there are some schools that are primary to five, some are primary to eight. Um, schools have different uh, food preparation equipment in them. So there's all these details we need to work out, but I know there's work happening on it already. There's a, a real interest to be fair about which schools get it first, and we want to start with the, the youngest grades first. Um, so I know people at the Department of Education are going to be, they're working on it now, and there'll be a lot of work happen over the summer. And once people come back for school in September, uh, there'll be some efforts then because teachers will be involved in this and everybody will need to get familiar and set up and our hope is is by the fall this program will be up and running and uh, the first part is is in the budget today about 18 million dollars and then as time goes on and it's expanded to other schools and other grades uh, it will it will grow in cost but it will also grow in benefit mm -hmm. a lot of desperate people will be looking at this budget and saying I want more in public housing Mm -hmm. They're not going to get it in this budget. Why, why not? Well, they are going to get it because we've increased uh, in just two and a half years, we've increased the number of rent supplements from 4,000 across the province to 8,500 in this budget. So we've more than doubled the number of rent supplements. That helps people who can identify housing, uh, which may be a bit out of their reach. The supplement can help bring it within their reach. I'm talking about building public housing, which is what all the experts are saying we yes. need to do more of. Well, we're trying to leverage the private sector. Uh, as you, you will know, we took the HS, the provincial sales tax, off the construction of uh, multi-unit residential housing. Um, so that is an incentive for the private sector. But 
if there's not enough happening through the private sector um, and through cooperative organizations that also build housing, we've taken the step to, in this budget, to build more public housing. And that's the first time in a long time that the province is investing in new public housing. It's more expensive to, to own, operate, maintain. Uh, we have the stats to prove that, but we're willing to accept that we need to do it. I need to ask you about the health care spending because it's massive in this budget as well. Um, <clears throat> it's a big dollar figure attached to it. Mm -hmm. Can, does it come with any guarantees or uh, confidence that you are going to move the needle on wait times and wait lists in this mm -hmm. province? I think we've been moving the needle already. In fact, if you look at long-term care beds, nursing home beds, when we, when we came to office two and a half years ago, there were 500 vacant beds because there was no nursing staff to have people in those beds. Those beds are all full now. Um, over 300 more have been added to the system. They're full. Um, there's a significant decrease in surgery wait lists. They're uh, still some of the highest in the country, though. Yes, and that is because we had a system uh, that was not, uh, it was not capable to handle the population we had, let alone the population we have now. So we're very interested in results. We want to be able to point to results, and in this budget, uh, we are building on the results we've gotten so far, and uh, we're hoping to achieve more. So many lines in the budget. We only have so much time. I appreciate you talking to us about it. Thank you, Tom. Coming up, more than 100 people were killed today and hundreds more injured while waiting for aid in Gaza City.
The Trudeau government released the long-awaited details today of its national pharmacare plan. Phase one will cover a number of birth control and diabetes medications for all Canadians. The Liberals and the NDP struck a deal on pharmacare last week, a key condition of their supply and confidence agreement. Marina von Stackelberg reports. This is how I give myself insulin. 12-year-old Raina Smith needs a digital monitor to watch her blood sugar and a pump to deliver insulin. Thousands of dollars in medical supplies for her type 1 diabetes, paid for through her parents' private health insurance plans for now. It makes me always worried about in the future because before all, this, um, all these medications were going to get covered, when I become an adult, how am I going to cover this? Do I have to choose a job based on what covers and what benefits benefit, uh, cover insulin, cover my pump? Worries Canada's health minister says she won't have any more. He's now introduced long-awaited pharmacare legislation. It commits the federal government to foot the bill for diabetes medication and devices, along with contraceptives, for everyone. It does not promise full coverage of all drugs. I think the question that Canadians are going to ask, once they get an opportunity to look at that data, is to say what is the most effective, um, efficient model to get to full coverage, um, to make sure that everybody can afford their medication, and that we choose the system that's right for that. Ottawa will also create a national list of essential drugs that it may eventually cover, and develop an agency to bulk purchase medication, all within one year of the legislation passing, which it likely will with the support of the NDP who pushed the Liberal government to bring in pharmacare and want to see all necessary medications covered. It also sets a structure for the, the builds a foundation for further expansion down in the future uh, for governments that want to go there. And of course, the New Democrats, uh, uh, if we're government, we would want to go there. Holland, wary to give a cost estimate for the two types of drugs, was pushed by reporters. You are the Minister of Health. This is a question you knew you were going to get coming out today. Oh, for sure, yeah. So what, so I, what are we looking at here? Maybe one and a half billion dollars. Like, I think it's, you know, the question is, is it going to be lower than that? Is it going to be a little bit higher? The health minister says Canadians could start getting their diabetes medication and birth control paid for as early as next year. But to get there, he'll first have to negotiate funding deals with the provinces and territories. So far, Alberta and Quebec have both said they're not interested in the plan. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. Statistics Canada has released its GDP numbers for the fourth quarter. It's the broadest measurement of everything this country produces. StatsCan reports the economy grew at an annualized rate of 1% as high interest rates weighed on growth, but not enough to push it into recession. StatsCan says growth in the fourth quarter was driven by a rise in exports, while housing and business investments both fell. That follows a third quarter decline of half a percent in real gross domestic product. Outside of 2020, when the pandemic took a sledgehammer to the economy, StatsCan says growth last year was at its slowest pace since 2016. Later tonight, most Mexicans will need a visa in order to enter Canada. The Liberal government is partially reviving a requirement it lifted eight years ago. The move comes amid pressure from provinces like Quebec and Ontario and from the United States. The CBC's Rafi Bujikanyan reports. As these travellers landed in Canada, their relatives here worried it might be their last visit for a while. Oh God, well that's very upsetting for us because we are trying to make Canada a living. So for our family it means another step um, or another boundary because now they, they will have to apply in order to come here to Canada. The federal government invoked broken rules Thursday when it announced it was changing them. We have seen a number of claimants cross from the northern part of the border into the into the southern, uh, into, the, into the United States. I won't exaggerate those flows, but they are significant. Mark Miller also said there has been a rising number of asylum claims from the region, including a 17% increase from Mexico last year. Most claims rejected by the Immigration Refugee Board or abandoned. The integrity of our immigration system is a top priority for us. But a majority of the asylum seekers who did come through have wound up in Quebec, which was looking for the return of visas and now still wants a billion dollars from Ottawa to help with the Mexicans here. I think we built 
the equivalent of about 50 schools for them in the last uh, few years. Uh, we have to give, give them health care services. Uh, right now, 30% of the uh, social help is going to them. The Mexican Foreign Affairs Department also reacted. It said Mexico regrets this decision and believes that there were other options available before putting this measure in place. And added, Mexico reserves the right to act in reciprocity. Ottawa's acknowledging this decision has angered Mexico, but says it had to act. It says it wants to work with the country to bolster an agricultural work program offering Mexican workers new opportunities here. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. The Hamas-run health authority says more than 100 people were killed today while waiting for aid near Gaza City. Witnesses say Israeli forces opened fire on them. Israel disputes that, saying most of those killed were crushed when people swarmed the aid trucks. Journalist Sarah Coates is in Tel Aviv with the latest. Absolutely horrific pictures coming in from the ground. More than 100 people have been killed, 700 others are wounded, with medics on the ground saying that hospitals are just completely overwhelmed and all they can do right now for the injured is provide first aid. We do have a statement from the Israeli military. It says that early this morning, 30 aid trucks crossed through the Karem Shalom crossing. When they reached Gaza City, they were stormed by residents, resulting in dozens of people people killed in what they're calling a crowd crush. It says then trucks moved further north. The army saying that armed people shot at trucks and started looting, saying it was at this point that soldiers fired warning shots aiming at the legs of people. At some point, the trucks were overwhelmed and the people driving the trucks, which were Gazan, uh, Gazan civilian drivers, uh, ploughed into um, the crowds of people, uh, ultimately killing, uh, my understanding is, tens of people. I, I don't have anything more specific to that. It is unfolding. Washington says it's looking into these reports, calling it a serious incident, while Hamas is also responding, saying that this could derail these hostage and ceasefire negotiations. Sarah Coates for CBC, Tel Aviv. Vladimir Putin issued a blunt warning today to the international community, saying any direct intervention in the war in Ukraine could spark a nuclear conflict. The Russian president made the ominous statement in a two-hour State of the Nation address. Putin says any move to send foreign troops into Ukraine could lead to the use of nuclear weapons and, quote, the destruction of civilization. He was responding to comments earlier this week by French President Emmanuel Macron, who floated the idea of Kyiv's allies sending soldiers to help with Ukraine's fight. Putin spoke on a range of issues today, but notably made no reference to the recent death of jailed Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny. Navalny's funeral is expected to be held tomorrow. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders are having to play defense after some season ticket holders said their new ad campaign was way offside. The CBC's Ashwarya Duda has the details. I lost my mind. It was a case of stereotype after stereotype, negative against girls, against women. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders are getting some backlash over the use of girl math to sell tickets. The CFL team sent out an email to season ticket holders that reads, proficient in girl math? It's basically free. The ad goes on to say, literally the best excuse to wear matching outfits and take the stairs, earn the seltzers. The team is trying to pull off the TikTok trend. If I pay for something with cash, it's free. Why? Girl math. I spent $200 at one store, but all the other stores we walked into, I didn't buy anything. So when you spread it out, that was good. You saved money. I saved money. What is this called? Girl math? Girl math. But some longtime football fans and some marketing experts say the Rough Riders fumbled on this one. Take the stairs and earn the Seltzers did it to me. Toxic diet culture. So this rugged and masculine brand personality calling women girls and talking about things like girl math can come off as a bit condescending. 
Um, when it comes to trends like girl math, it's one thing for girls to make fun of themselves and another for a man to poke fun of you. I'm assuming they're trying to get like girls interested in football and increase their viewership. But I think that's interesting to not assume that, hey, maybe girls actually want to watch football and they're not just here to do stereotypical things that we've been told like we need to do. So I think it's I think it's a pretty out of touch ad. I'm a little embarrassed for whoever made it. The writers say the ad was a playful attempt at the TikTok trend, but missed the mark. And for that, they unequivocally apologize. They also say women in the marketing department came up with the ad, but they accept it didn't resonate with fans. And quite disappointing. After the writers issued their apology, we checked back with Anne-Marie Sauer. She says she's pleased with the apology, but still confused and concerned that this kind of mistake was made in the first place. Ashwarya Duda, CBC News, Saskatoon. Canada's main stock index gained more than 100 points today, boosted by gains in energy stocks, while U.S. markets also rose. Here's a look at the numbers.
For news you can trust, we have the latest on what's happening in your community and a weather forecast you can rely on no matter where you are in Atlantic Canada. I'm Amy Smith. And I'm Ryan Snodden. Join us for Atlantic tonight. Right after the National. Yeah, it's going to be chilly tonight. Oh, and tomorrow, too. Tomorrow as well, yeah. With the yeah. wind chill, mm -hmm. right? The wind is definitely going to be remaining persistent. Uh, not nearly as strong as last night, thankfully. Mm -hmm. And I blame that wind uh, for uh, waking me up, uh, keeping me up <laughs> through the, the <laughs> overnight. You a lot of other people. Yeah. Like. yeah, well, I'm off my game today because uh, <laughs> oh, I meant no. to put this graphic in the main forecast. Right, okay. So yeah. I'm circling back You've to got it time. now. Yeah, we've got a few minutes, so let's just look at some of these uh, peak wind gusts from last night. I mentioned earlier, East Knoll, uh, 119 kilometers per hour there on Cobbequid Bay. Uh, Comoville at 109, and Beaver Island at 100. Plateau in there in Inverness County at 117. That's a lace wet wind there, but uh, yeah, pretty impressive winds for sure. And in terms of the rainfall, in case you missed it, uh, yeah, we, again, Certainly saw some heavier totals in through Digby County, uh, some 70 to 80 millimeter amounts there. But uh, yeah, Sussex area and New Brunswick hit hard, 92, mm. uh, 160 wow. local reports there of up to 200 millimeters. And we uh, obviously saw localized flooding uh, in that area. So unfortunately uh, for those folks there, that's all freezing up now and really causing a mess uh, as that cold air mass really settles in under this area of high pressure. Uh, note. Through the uh, timeline tonight, those flurry chances uh, will be certainly in the mix. The best chances are going to be in the north and east and in Inverness uh, County, where we have a snow squall watch, which is in effect and will linger into tomorrow as well. Temperatures will range from the getting up to around the freezing mark for the Yarmouth area for tomorrow. Most of us, though, minus two to minus six and minus sevens across uh, the Northumberland shore and into Cape Breton. There's a quick look at Saturday. I want to show you that seven day forecast in case you missed it earlier. Mm -hmm. Certainly looking like spring there. It Warming sure up is. for sure. Okay, computers, well, they used to be the size of a small <laughs> building, but now they can fit in the palm of your hand as a smartphone. That's right, and there is a tech company that's well on the way to taking the next step, an AI pin. You can see that I have it over here. Okay. Um, Hi. And I can also, you know, cycle through important information and navigate okay, through the great. device. The AI pin looks like a badge and it operates on voice commands and gestures. A laser projector lets the wearer use their hand as a screen and a navigation device. Some of the built in tech includes an advanced search function, AI assisted me messaging, language translation, and a computer vision system. Technology. The future. Yeah, the future <laughs> is here. That's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night.